and we are back for overanalyzing House of the Dragon, our way too long series on how it came to be that Rhaenyra's blacks faced off against Aegon's greens. After years of people doing their best to keep the woman Rhaenys off the throne, suddenly people are totally fine with women ruling in order to keep Daemon Targaryen off the throne. We find that Daemon appears to have been framed for a joke, and Rhaenyra is named heir. And so let's continue. Prince Daemon was not amongst them, however. Furious at the king's decree, the prince quit King's Landing, resigning from the city watch. He went first to Dragonstone, taking his paramour Mosaria with him upon the back of his dragon Caraxes, the lean red beast the small folk called the Bloodworm. There he remained for half a year, during which time he got Mosaria with child. And so, after the naming of Rhaenyra as heir, Daemon Targaryen makes an enormous change in his life. He decides to move to Dragonstone, and decides to have a child with Masaria, his paramour, later giving her an egg. Now, it's not too difficult to figure out what Daemon is doing. After being disinherited, it would be rather clear to him that he has enemies working against him, likely the Hightowers. Having dragon-riding children would give him more power and more options in the future. Thus, moving to Dragonstone with Masaria makes a lot of sense. Masaria is Lysene, thus likely of Valyrian descent, so Daemon would probably think he could produce a bonafide dragon rider child. Now, on a side note, I do find the name Bloodworm for Caraxes an odd name. A worm is a legless and wingless dragon, and while Caraxes is lean, it's hard to believe that small folk would nickname the beast a worm. That's W-Y-R-M, as it's not really a regularly used term. And Masaria is the white worm, W-O-R-M, and so I do wonder if Caraxes' nickname is just another way to disparage Daemon by Gildane. He's always surrounded by worms. That said, there is a bit of a retcon with Caraxes. While here in the Rogue Prince, the small folk are the ones who name the dragon, later our author writes in an earlier chapter of Fire and Blood that the nickname was given by the Dragon Keepers. So, who knows where Bloodworm comes from. When he learned that his concubine was pregnant, Prince Daemon presented her with a dragon's egg. But in this, he again went too far and woke his brother's wrath. King Viserys commanded him to return the egg, send his whore away, and return to his lawful wife, or else be attainted as a traitor. The prince obeyed, though with ill grace, dispatching Masaria, eggless, back to Lys, whilst he himself flew to Runestone in the Vale and the unwelcome company of his bronze bitch. But Masaria lost her child during a storm on the narrow sea. When word reached Prince Daemon, he spoke no syllable of grief but his heart hardened against the king, his brother. Thereafter, he spoke of King Viserys only with disdain, and began to brood day and night on the succession. So, next Daemon tries to give Masaria a dragon egg, clearly hoping it will hatch and he will either have a dragon rider paramour or a dragon rider child. Now, throughout history, we don't really get an explanation on who gets dragons and eggs and who doesn't. Emma Aaron, for example, didn't have a dragon, and neither did many children of Jaehaerys. Were they not presented eggs, or were they presented eggs and they didn't hatch? Did they try to claim dragons? Were they encouraged to? Were they dissuaded? Did they fail? We simply don't know. It is rather interesting that Laenor Valarian ended up with an egg that hatched into sea smoke, and Lena Valarian later claimed Vagar. Perhaps Laenor was given an egg that Rhaenys' dragon Melis laid? but it's uncertain how Lena Valarian, who resided on Driftmark, got to King's Landing and was allowed into the Dragon Pit to claim Vagar. It's a very weird occurrence, especially after the Valarians were screwed over by the Council of 101. Why allow a spurned party to have so much power? And it's not like anyone can just go into the Dragon Pit and claim a dragon. Sarah Targaryen specifically tried to do this and was denied. Whatever the case, it doesn't seem that there was any rule set in stone about eggs and who gets them. There is no stated reason why Daemon's child, a bastard he or she may be, should be denied an egg. Now, what is strikingly different about Daemon and Masaria's egg hatching plans is that the actions are not in line with previous Targaryens. The prior practice was to place an egg in the cradle of a young Targaryen. This is the first time that we hear about a pregnant woman getting an egg. This is significant as we know Daenerys was pregnant and miscarried right before her dragons hatched. Daenerys' experience had nothing to do with placing eggs in cradles. Whatever happened, 
pregnancy was much more likely the factor. Damon, it seemed, was on to something by having the egg be around a pregnant woman. Still, it was rather obvious that Damon was attempting to secure a second dragon, and doing so right after being disinherited does certainly give the impression that Damon is preparing for war in the future. So, in this respect, alarm in King's Landing was perhaps warranted. Though, again, no one thought anything was suspicious about Lena Valarian claiming Vagar. I actually think this is a huge plot hole. Whatever the case, I will say the command from Viserys to Daemon is unusually harsh and undiplomatic. There have been no established rules on who gets dragon eggs that we know of, and the threat to label Daemon a traitor is a quick escalation. Also, is it really the king's business whether Daemon lives in the Vale or not? One could understand why they would not want Daemon on Dragonstone, but the command for him to return to the Vale is a bit superfluous and later a completely forgotten desire. He leaves the Vale within weeks and no one seems to care. It's kind of another plot hole. But perhaps most significant is the language surrounding Masaria. It's completely uncalled for. Masaria was a dancer and not a sex worker as far as we know. Calling Damon's paramour a whore crosses a line. It makes one wonder why Grand Maester Runketer would allow such a message to go out. How much of these words are truly Viserys's? We are specifically told that Viserys was not a strong-willed king. Amiable, anxious to please, relying greatly on the council of men around him. And so we must wonder how much of these words are from the small council. Are these the words of Otto Hightower? Did Grand Maester Runketer want conflict between the brothers or simply not care if conflict occurred? Based on the contents of the message, one would expect absolute rage from Daemon. And yet, despite Gildane claiming ill grace, it's rather surprising that Daemon took the command fairly well. Against all odds, he did exactly as he was told. That's right, Viserys disinherits Daemon over a lie, calls his paramour a whore, orders her away, and has Daemon return to his barren wife, who, by the way, Daemon only married to help secure Balon and Viserys' path to the throne. And Daemon just takes it. This shows incredible restraint from the rogue prince. Now, let's remember that Daemon has control over the city watch and a really big dragon. I can actually only think of one reason why Daemon is so obedient here after being treated so poorly, and that has to do with the next paragraph, and the Valarians. Lena Valarian, who rides Vagar, is single, and now so is Viserys. Daemon needs to tread lightly. If he threatens anyone, it would cause Viserys to align with the Valarians. Now, Missaria has a miscarriage on the trip back to Lys, and when word makes it to Daemon in the Vale, he supposedly spoke no syllable of grief, but instead began to brood on succession. Which doesn't make any sense at all. Why brood now over succession? The miscarriage has nothing to do with succession. I do believe there has been a mix-up here in Gildane's telling of history. You see, there are two messages that come to Daemon in the Vale. There is him finding out Missaria miscarried, which he supposedly has no outward emotional reaction to and begins to brood about succession over. And there's the message where he hears about Viserys' betrothal to Alicent Hightower, which he supposedly beats up a serving man over. And this also doesn't make any sense. Shouldn't he expect Viserys to remarry? Shouldn't he suspect that this was a Hightower plan all along? Why the fury? It appears the reactions to the messages have been swapped. As I explained last time, the timeline from late 105 to late 106 is pretty packed. Six months on Dragonstone, and then the trip to Lys, and word getting to him in the Vale about the miscarriage, and then him hearing about the betrothal, going to Driftmark, gathering an army, and then heading to the Stepstones to start a war. It's a packed, packed schedule. Which means the message where Damon hears about the miscarriage, and the message where Damon hears about the betrothal, must have been very close in time to one another, within weeks. And it makes much more sense that Damon became enraged when hearing about Masaria's miscarriage, and that he responded to the betrothal without emotion and began brooding on succession, yes? Gildane appears to have mixed up the stories. Anyway, continuing on. Though Princess Rhaenyra had been proclaimed her father's successor, there were many in the realm, at court and beyond it, who still hoped that Viserys might father a male heir, for the young king was not yet thirty. Grand Maester Runketer was the first to urge his grace to remarry, even suggesting a suitable choice. 
the Lady Lena Valarian, who had just turned 12, a fiery young maiden freshly flowered, Lady Lena had inherited the beauty of a true Targaryen from her mother, Rhaenys, and a bold adventurous spirit from her father, the Sea Snake. As Lord Corlys loved to sail, Lena loved to fly, and had claimed for her own no less amount than mighty Vagar, the oldest and largest of the Targaryen dragons since the passing of the Black Dread in 94 AC. By taking the girl to wife, the king could heal the rift that had grown up between the Iron Throne and Driftmark, Runkerter pointed out, and Lena would surely make a splendid queen. And so here we find that despite Viserys having named an heir, there were powers who hoped that Viserys would father a male heir. Now, Gildane passes over this quite quickly and sneakily, trying to make the reader think that a male born of Viserys would become the new heir. But this is not the case. Viserys named an heir, Rhaenyra, People came to King's Landing and swore oaths to her. It's done. Suggesting that a new child would come before her is simply wrong. And what Gildane is describing is treason at court. Gildane straight up tells us that despite the king's ruling, people wanted outcomes other than the king's ruling. People at court, people outside of court. And in this context of hoping for a male heir, that is, hoping for something other than the king's ruling, Grand Maester Runketer suggests Viserys remarry. And this is pretty huge, actually. It's perhaps the most direct statement from Gildane that the Citadel was actively working against Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra is heir, people hoped for a male heir, Runketer takes action. And so Runketer pushes Lena Valarian. Now, the suggestion of Lena Valarian may at first seem puzzling if one is thinking that there's a Maester conspiracy going on. Aren't the Maesters biased against the Valarians? Aren't they biased against Rhaenys' kin? Aren't they biased against dragon riders? Isn't that why Aemon was possibly murdered and Rhaenys was passed over while the Valarians were stuck on Tarth and the Council of 101 was put together to prevent Rhaenys, Lena, and Laenor from inheriting? Why on earth, if there is a conspiracy, would Grand Maester Runketer push a Valarian, the daughter of Rhaenys, a dragon rider. Wouldn't that ensure that the children of Viserys and Lena were dragon riders and egg hatchers and all of that? And the answer is no, actually. Grand Maester Runketer is being very, very clever with his suggestion. You see, Lena Valarian, despite Runketer's suggestion, is really an absolutely terrible choice of a wife for Viserys. Let's remember that Viserys was forced into marrying Emma Arryn when she was 11 and was bedding her at 12 in hopes of a child, and the complications of pregnancy at too young of an age were said to be contributing factors to her death, and her fairly recent death has led Viserys to alcoholism. And now Grand Maester Runketer is pushing a girl who just turned 12. Well, actually, Lena Valarian's age was retconned to 13 in later versions of Fire and Blood, and weirdly, this passage was not changed by the editors. Regardless, our author's intention when he wrote this was that Lena was far too young. In fact, in the next paragraph, we find out that it's very clearly Lena's age that is the issue for her not being chosen. The point being, Grand Maester Runketer likely knew that Lena Valarian was too young for Viserys' tastes. In fact, this is likely a callback to Daenerys being 13 when she married Khal Drogo and her brother Viserys worrying that she was too young. When told by Illyrio not to worry, Viserys essentially concludes that Khal Drogo is a pedophile. Without a burning political need, a 12 or 13 year old Lena is simply not a realistic choice for Viserys. Had Runketer really wanted this match, he would have waited two or three years before suggesting it. Instead, he pushes the idea of marriage prematurely and is denied. But the subject of marriage stays on the table, and so a new bride is presented. Viserys I Targaryen was not the strongest willed of kings, it must be said. Always amiable and anxious to please, he relied greatly on the counsel of the men around him and did as they bade more oft than not. In this instance, however, his grace had his own notion, and no amount of argument would sway him from his course. He would marry again, yes, but not to a 12-year-old girl, and not for reasons of state. Another woman had caught his eye he announced his intention to wed Lady Alicent of House Hightower, the clever and lovely 18-year-old daughter of the King's Hand, the girl who had read to King Jaehaerys as he lay dying. And so next Viserys announces that he intends to marry Alicent Hightower instead of Lena Valarian, with the primary reason being that she is 18 and not 12, 
and that she showed a caring heart as she read to King Jaehaerys as he lay dying. Now, I will say, the insistence that Viserys came to his own decision about this is suspicious. By Gildane's own admission, Viserys deciding for himself is out of character. But also, look at the phrasing. His grace had his own notion, and no amount of argument would sway him from his course. This implies that the small council tried to talk Viserys out of his decision, which, first of all, isn't believable as Otto Hightower is on the small council, but also, in the very next paragraph, it is said, there could be no possible objection to the king's choice. So, which was it? Was there argument or not? Because no amount of argument would sway him makes it sound like there was argument, but no possible objection makes it sound like there wasn't argument. Let's remember that the source for anything that happens on the small council is Grand Maester Runketer. Neither Mushroom nor Septon Eustace would have eyes on what went down. Essentially, this is what happened according to Grand Maester Runketer, the same man who was trying to change Viserys' heir and proposed a 12-year-old bride. He is the one claiming that Viserys came to his own decision. Not exactly a man we can trust. And also, we don't actually know how the decision was made. Did Viserys just bring up Alicent out of the blue? Or did the council bring her up and it was a choice between the two girls, Lena and Alicent? Perhaps something like, Your Grace, many believe it's time you remarry. Lena of House Valarian is an excellent choice. A girl of 12, freshly flowered, who can repair the rift between you and House Valarian. Or perhaps my daughter, Alicent, a maid of 18, who read to your father as he lay dying. Framed as a choice between the two, one can still say that Viserys came to his own decision all by himself. What is unsaid is that the decision itself to marry and the limiting of options comes from the small council. The High Towers of Old Town were an ancient and noble family, of impeccable lineage. There could be no possible objection to the king's choice of bride. Even so, there were those who murmured that the hand had risen above himself that he had brought his daughter to court with this in mind. A few even cast doubt on Lady Alicent's virtue, suggesting she had welcomed King Viserys into her bed even before Queen Emma's death. These calumnies were never proved, though Mushroom repeats them in his testimony and goes so far as to claim that reading was not the only service Lady Alicent performed for the old king in his bedchamber. In the Vale, Prince Damon reportedly whipped the serving man who brought the news to him within an inch of his life, nor was the sea snake pleased when word reached Driftmark. House Valarian had been passed over once again. His daughter Lena, scorned just as his son Lenor had been scorned at the Great Council, and his wife by the old king back in 92 AC. Only Lady Lena herself seemed untroubled. Her ladyship shows far more interest in flying than in boys, the maester at high tide wrote to the Citadel. And so here Maester Gildane speaks of the ancient, noble, and impeccable lineage of House Hightower. Now, the idea of impeccable lineage is certainly a weird one. What exactly does that mean? What statement is being made about the pedigree of the Hightowers? Well, within Ice and Fire, lineage is spoken of in terms of either tracing one back to great houses or to Targaryen blood. So considering the fact that the Targaryens have only been in Westeros 200 years, we must be thinking about tracing the High Towers back to Westerosi great houses. And so impeccable lineage, that is, faultless lineage, likely means that the High Towers were only marrying other noble high-level houses, or at least the inheriting lords did. For example, in the current story, Leighton Hightower is married to a Florent, and his heir is married to a Rowan. But here's the thing, there aren't that many houses with a status high enough to marry a high tower, especially when limited to just the reach where most of the marriages will be. The high towers are going to be taking brides from the same dozen or so families who are also intermarried, and of course, cousin-to-cousin -cousin marriages are rather common in the story. So in the end, when someone says impeccable lineage, they're inadvertently saying inbred. Now, being inbred certainly means something when we speak of Targaryens or Starks or Blackwoods, as we know that they have special genes that allow them to fly dragons or skin change animals. But we know nothing about any Hightower abilities. That said, the children of Alicent Hightower were dragon riders. Now, perhaps all of their special abilities came from their father, but it's still worth noting this fact. And while the show has gone the path of portraying Alicent Hightower as a brunette, 
as did the art in Fire and Blood, in the actual text, we have no idea what Alice and Hightower looked like. In fact, in the entire story of Ice and Fire, we only know the looks of two Hightowers. There's Aleary Hightower, who has silver hair, and there's Lyness Hightower, who has golden hair and who Jorah says looks like Daenerys. And let's remember that Alicent Hightower was mistaken for Sarah Targaryen by King Jaehaerys in his later days, so it's of course possible that Alicent looked like Sarah. On this hair color issue, it's worth noting that in the show, Targaryens are always portrayed with platinum white hair, but in the book, they also have silver gold hair. And so while all of this evidence is admittedly rather thin, we should at least be open-minded to the idea that the Hightowers could be like the Targaryens. That is, inbred, with gold and silver hair, and perhaps with special genes. Now, Gildane also mentions that some unnamed people thought Otto Hightower had risen above himself and intended his daughter Alicent to marry Viserys. This is, of course, almost certainly the case. This was certainly Tywin's plan when he was Hand. He wanted Cersei to marry Rhaegar, though it didn't work out. But ignoring the parallels, the evidence is rather thick. We know by his own words that Otto was worrying about the succession of the Iron Throne, and within months his own child is queen, and eventually his grandchild claim it to the throne. Obviously this was his plan. Now interestingly, we hear of a few who cast doubt on Alicent's virtue, claiming that she was sleeping with Viserys prior to Emma Arryn's death. Of course, we know that Robb Stark felt obligated to marry a woman he slept with, so this may be a similar situation, and we know that Alicent caught Viserys' eye back when Jaehaerys was still alive, so at least he was harboring feelings for Alicent prior to Emma's death. Though, like everything else, we don't have much evidence to support the affair other than a few people suggesting it, whoever these few people were. Clearly, Gildane would like us to believe that the rumor is false by mentioning that Mushroom repeats it, and then pairs it with a rumor that she was performing sexual favors for Jaehaerys. This rumor with Jaehaerys, by the way, is a retcon. In The Rogue Prince, the rumor is again that Alicent was sleeping with Daemon Targaryen, with no mention that the rumor came from Mushroom. Now, we've talked about how Daemon's reaction to the news, that is, him beating up a serving man, doesn't really make sense, and that Gildane is mixing up history here. And then we get a reaction to the news from House Valarian, who are displeased that Lena was not chosen, scorned just as Lenor and Rhaenys had been scorned. This is actually somewhat accurate, Besides conspiracy against them, a contributing factor to them not being chosen was Lenor's age in 101 and Rhaenys' age in 92. An excuse was that they were too young to be monarch, just as Lena is too young to marry. Though again, there really does seem to be a conspiracy against them. And then we get a final line about Lena Valarian that is very odd. It states that she is more interested in flying than boys. Now, on first read, this appears to be Lena's feelings for Viserys. Except Viserys is not a boy. He's a 29-year-old man. No, Gildane is deceiving us here, and what the Driftmark Maester appears to be speaking of is Lena's betrothal to the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos, which happens shortly after Viserys' betrothal to Alicent. The son of the Sea Lord is most certainly a boy. In fact, he was still considered a boy almost nine years later in 115 when Daemon kills him. So back in 106, he's likely around nine years old or younger. Very clearly, the Driftmark Maester was not thinking about Lena's feelings towards Viserys, but towards the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos. That is, she was not yet interested in romance, so she would not object to this match. But the timing of this all very much highlights the extent of the Maester conspiracy. While one Maester was faux pushing a Lena betrothal to Viserys when she was far too young, in hopes of an Alicent betrothal, Another maester was pushing a real betrothal of Lena to the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos. And this is a good place to stop. We will continue on with Damon's War on the Stepstones in part 11. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.